And Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. This is a, this is a good season for pondering. And I invite you to do some reflecting with me. Let's, let's pray together. Grant, Lord, that this Christmas might be your Christmas. Above all, the Mass, the celebration, the recognition and adoration of your people who see you present here. That's what we want. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Listen to these, uh, these wonderful words from the poet Carl Sandburg. A baby slung in a feed box, back in a barn in a Bethlehem slum. A baby's first cry mixed with the crunch of a mule's teeth on Bethlehem Christmas corn. Baby fists softer than snowflakes in Norway. The vagabond mother of Christ and the vagabond men of wisdom all in a barn on a winter's night and a baby there in swaddling cloths on hay why does the story never wear out? Well, Sandberg's question set me to wondering, why is it? Why does the Christmas story never wear out? Well, I can give you three good reasons. For one thing, the story never wears out because it's useful. For one thing, it's useful. It's a perennial source of revenue. And among those who would come to see the Christ child in the manger, Herod, as we were reminded last week, Herod stands as the ominous symbol of all those who would take advantage of the opportunity. For others, the story never, never wears out because it stirs hope deep in the heart. And of those who would come to see the child in the manger, the shepherds, Stand for me in their simplicity, for all the garden variety people who look for signs of goodness in our everyday lives. But for some, this wonderful story never wears out because it's true. Beyond logical explanation, the story tells us that God is with us in Jesus Christ. And so the story calls us to worship. And here, for me, it's the Magi with their gifts who kneel in the place of all wisdom that bows in the presence of simple, uncluttered truth. It must be a, a good 35 years ago that Harry Reasoner first offered a little essay on the Christmas edition of the TV news program, 60 Minutes. I, th I think it's one of those items that really warrants being rebroadcast at least once a year. This is what Harry Reasoner said. The basis for this annual burst of buying things and gift giving and parties and near hysteria is a quiet event that Christians believe actually happened a long time ago. You can say that in all societies there's always been a midwinter festival and that many of the trappings of our Christmas are almost violently pagan. But you come back to the central fact of the day and the quietness of Christmas morning, the birth of God on earth. It leaves you only three ways of accepting Christmas. One is cynically, as a time to make money and the endorsing of making it, one is graciously the appropriate attitude for non-Christians who wish their fellow citizens all the joy to which their belief entitles them. The third, of course, is reverently. If this is the anniversary of the appearance of the Lord of the universe 
in the form of a helpless babe, it is a very important day. It's a startling idea, of course. My guess is that the whole story, that a virgin was selected by God to bear his son as a way of showing his love and concern for humanity, it's my guess that in spite of all the lip service given to it, it is not an idea that has been popular with theologians. It is a somewhat illogical idea, and theologians like logic almost as much as they like God. It is so revolutionary a thought that it could only come from a God that is beyond logic and beyond theology. It has a magnificent appeal. Almost nobody has seen God, and almost nobody has any real idea of what God's like. And the truth is that among humans, the idea of seeing God suddenly and standing in a very bright light is not necessarily a completely comforting and appealing idea. But everyone has seen babies, and most people like them. So if God wanted to be loved as well as feared, he moved correctly here. If he wanted to know his people as well as rule them, he moved correctly here. For a baby growing, growing up learns all about people. If God wanted to be intimately a part of humankind, he moved correctly. For the experience of birth and familyhood is our most intimate and precious experience. So it comes beyond logic. It is either all falsehood or it is the truest thing in the world. It's the story of the great innocence of God the baby, God in the power of humanity. And it has such dramatic shock toward the heart that if, if it is not true, then for Christians, nothing's true. And so if a Christian is touched only once a year, the touching is still worth it. And maybe on some given Christmas, some final quiet morning, the touch will take. <laughs> I love that. Why does the story never wear out? Harry Reasoner reminds us of three ways of coming to Christmas. Cynically, graciously, and reverently. And unless I miss my guess, most everybody here has something of all three inside. And so occasionally I think it's helpful to draw a clear distinction between those ways of coming to Christmas. Otherwise you can come to Christmas like, sort of like the traditional Christmas pudding. You know, a, a, a sort of unidentifiable, uh, unidentifiable gooey amalgam of thoughts and feelings that generally leave a good taste in your mouth, but you're never quite sure why. <laughs> <laughs> so why is it that this story never wears out? Well, for some people, the story never wears out because it's useful. Every year, the recreation of the Christmas story offers unprecedented opportunity for personal gain. It may sound cynical, but it's true. I'm reminded of the elementary school teacher who asked his class after the vacation how they'd spent their Christmas. And one child said, well, I'm Catholic, so we went to midnight mass. And then in the morning, we had a big breakfast, and we sat around the Christmas tree and opened presents. And another child said, well, I'm Presbyterian. And, well... We had a candlelight service, and, and then we did about the same thing. Our, on Christmas morning, we had breakfast, and then we sat around the tree and opened our presents. And the third child said, well, we aren't Christians. But we did have a big breakfast, and we opened presents around the tree. And then we all got in the car and went downtown to my dad's store, and he showed us all the empty shelves and all the money, and then we joined hands and made a circle around the cash register and sang, what a friend we have in Jesus. <laughs> There's a, there's a hint of Herod in that humor. You can hear an ever so faint reprise of his cynical words. Go search diligently for the child. Let me know where he can be found so that I too might come and worship him. Why does the story never wear out? One reason is because it's useful. It helps us get what we want. 
Thank God the cynical view is often melted away by a second, much more generous approach. Reasoner talks about the gracious way that some people are touched by the Christmas story. You needn't be a Christian to feel the hope that the Christmas story evokes in the human heart. It's a true story. The little girl took the jar with the coins in it, and she slipped out the door and made her way through the snow to the small-town drugstore. You know about small-town drugstores? She waited patiently for the pharmacist to notice her, but he was busy talking with some man. So Tess made a scuffing noise with her feet. Nothing. She cleared her throat. Still no response. Finally, she took a quarter from her jar and started tapping it on the counter. That did it. And what do you want? The pharmacist asked in an annoyed tone of voice. I'm talking to my brother here from Chicago. I, I haven't seen him in ages. Why well, I want to talk to you about my brother, Tess answered in the same annoyed tone. He's really, really sick, and I want to buy a miracle. I beg your pardon, said the pharmacist. His name is Andrew, and he has something bad growing inside his head, and my dad says that only a miracle can save him now. So how much does a miracle cost? We don't sell miracles, said the pharmacist, his voice softening. I'm, I'm sorry, but I can't help you. I have the money to pay for it, she said. If it isn't enough, I'll get the rest. Just tell me how much it costs. The pharmacist's brother knelt down and asked the little girl, what kind of miracle does your brother need? I don't know, Tess replied, her eyes welling up. I just know he's really sick, and Mommy says he needs an operation, but my dad can't pay for it, so I want to use my money. How much do you have? asked the man from Chicago. One dollar and eleven cents, Tess replied barely, audibly. It's all the money I have, but I can get some more if I need to. Well, what a coincidence, smiled the man. A dollar and eleven cents, the exact price of a miracle for little brothers. He took her money in one hand, and with the other hand he grasped her mitten and said, Would you take me to where you live? I want to see your brother and meet your parents. Let's see if I have the miracle you need. The man was Carlton Armstrong, a neurosurgeon. The operation was completed without charge, and it wasn't long until Andrew was home again and doing well. Mom and Dad were talking about the chain of events that had led them to this place. That surgery, the mother said, that was, that was a real miracle. I, I wonder how much it would have cost. Tess smiled. She knew exactly how much a miracle cost, a dollar and eleven cents, <laughs> plus the faith of a little child. A miracle is not the suspension of natural law. It's the operation of a higher law. I sense the spirit of the shepherds in that story. You catch a hint there of that first Christmas Eve when people simply followed their hearts, went looking for the good, and found it. There's great hope for all of us in that timeless message of the angels to the shepherds, peace on earth among those in whom goodwill is found. When one person reaches out in goodwill to touch the hope of goodness in others, we discover once more the grace of the Christmas story. We all need that goodwill from time to time, all of us, and that's another reason why the story never wears out. But there's one more reason why the story never wears out, and that's because it's true. Reasoner used the word reverence to describe the attitude of those who believe that the story is true. I, I, I don't think he could have chosen a better word. You know, the, the older I get, the more certain I am that at the heart of worship, there's a deep mystery. And I call it a mystery because I, I don't have to be able to explain it to accept 
that it's true. When I was young and knew an awful lot more than I know now, and was sure about what I thought were the facts about God, I uh, tended to reserve my reverence for those things that I could understand. To me, it was very comforting to know that God, the God I worshipped could always be counted on to act reasonably and fairly and logically. <laughs> the older I get, and hopefully wiser, I find myself coming to the Christmas story like I come to so many of God's great mysteries with that same sort of reverent confession that Reasoner talked about. Listen again to his words. So it comes beyond logic. It is either all falsehood or it's the truest thing in the world. It's the story of the great innocence of God, the baby, God in the power of humanity, and it has such dramatic shock toward the heart that if, if it is not true, then for Christians, nothing is true. C.S. Lewis put the, the matter in rather compelling terms. He said that either Jesus was a fraud, a charlatan, and we should repudiate him as a liar, or he was deluded, a, a poor fool, and we should pity him, or he was who he claimed to be, God with us, and we should worship him. In simple terms, that's the issue that you and I face with the Christmas story. Either Jesus was a fraud, and this whole business of Christmas is open game for the cynics, those who are out to pursue selfish advantage, or Jesus was deluded, a basically good man who unfortunately died a martyr's death, and that was really the end of it. And if that's so, then the story of Christmas becomes little more than a wistful but unrealistic wish for peace on earth. Or Jesus is who he claimed to be, God incarnate, the God who acted and who acts beyond logic, beyond human understanding, if it is true that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, then like the Magi, perhaps our most appropriate gift of worship would be to reverently lay our wisdom, or what we think is our wisdom, at the foot of that cradle. easier said than done. You know, giving up our claim to wisdom, looking at the Christmas story through childlike eyes, that's a hard thing for many of us to do. But that's just what we have to do if we want to understand most deeply why this story never wears out. Let me tell you about one man who learned this truth from a child Tomorrow morning, said the surgeon, I'll open your heart. You'll find Jesus there, replied the boy. The surgeon looked up, annoyed. I'll cut open your heart, he continued, to see how much damage has been done. But when you open up my heart, you'll see Jesus in there. The surgeon looked to the parents, who sat silently. When I see how much damage has been done, I will sew up your heart and your chest, and I'll plan what to do next. But you'll find Jesus in my heart. The Bible says he lives there. You'll find him in my heart. The surgeon had had enough. I'll tell you what I'll find in your heart. I will find damaged muscle, low blood supply, weakened vessels, and I'll find out if I can make you well. And you'll find Jesus there too. He lives there. The surgeon left. He sat in his office recording his notes from the surgery, damaged aorta, damaged pulmonary vein, widespread muscle degeneration, no hope for transplant, no hope for cure, therapy, painkillers and bed rest, prognosis, death probably within a year. Stop the recorder. 
there was still more to be said. In the solitude of his office, he looked up and he asked out loud, Why? Why did you do this? You've put him here, you've put him in this pain, and you've cursed him to an early death. Why? And in the stillness, the Lord answered, This boy, my lamb, was not meant for your flock for long. He's part of my flock and will be forever. Here in my flock, he will feel no pain, and he will be comforted as you cannot imagine. His parents will one day join him here, and they will know peace, and my flock will continue to grow. The surgeon's tears were hot, but his anger was hotter. You created that boy, and you created that heart, and he'll be dead in months. Why? And the Lord answered, This boy, my lamb, will return to my flock because he's done his duty. I did not put my lamb with your flock to lose him, but to retrieve another lost lamb. The surgeon wept. The surgeon sat by the boy's bed. The boy's parents sat across from him. The boy woke up and whispered, Did you cut open my heart? Yes, said the surgeon. What did you find? asked the boy. I found Jesus there. So it comes beyond logic. It is either all falsehood or it is the truest thing in the world. It's the story of the great innocence of God, the baby, God in the power of humanity. So if a Christian is touched only once a year, the touching is still worth it. And maybe on some given Christmas, some final quiet morning, the touch will take. That's my prayer. That if you have never invited Jesus to live in your heart, that this Christmas will be the time when the touch finally takes. Let's pray together. How silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessing of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming. But in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. That's your promise, Lord. And this is my prayer. And I offer it in behalf of any and all who may choose to identify and say, yes, those are my words as well. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell, Oh, come to us. Abide with us, our Lord, Emmanuel. Amen. Amen.